Afam buza maka nke mdele mwamba. Abu mwenye ibu. Ndi mwolom buza maka nabele chuku. Ndi mwolofa buwa rasyonu na mwofu wako. Ndi mwolofa bu udu na ako demano. Ndi mwolofa mwofu wako. Abu mwenye ububu wako iwolo izi wako. Ndi banyi bute meba Simbi ya wunu. Onye mbo. Onye anyibo. Na ana anuwa. Ekele mbunu. My name is Uzamaka in Kemdelen Wampa. I'm an Igbo woman. daughter of Ebele Chuku and Uzamaka, granddaughter of Mwara Shiono and Mwufuako, great-granddaughter of Udu and Womoga, great-great-granddaughter of Akodomano. I am from the Iwolo people, Eziago, Obubuago, my ancestors have sent me here to ask for permission from the indigenous people of this land to tell our stories. Thank you for having us. Is anybody out there? Hello? Is anybody out there? I wasn't sure. Okay, there's people out here. Hi! How y'all doing? When I say Denison Quinu, your response is yeah. Denison Quinu. Yeah. Denison Quinu. Yeah. Denison Quinu. Yeah. When I say Des Denison Quezuonu, I need you to make all the sounds in the world. Stomp your feet, clap your hands. Denison Quezuonu. Nice. Okay, you're alive. You're awake. You're you're here. Okay. So I'm of the thought, the thinking process, that we, when we sing together and dance together and make music together, we connect with each other. We see each other. We feel each other. We know each other. So this is going to be a bit of a social experiment. Bear with me. Do y'all like bread? Oh yeah, bread's good, huh? White or wheat? Okay, we'll go with both, how about that? Okay? So you all in this section, you're gonna hold down the bread section, okay? And you over here, you're going to hold down the peanut butter section. <laughs> okay, fine, almond butter if you're from California. <laughs> so, white or wheat bread? 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 White. No sound, just your hands or your feet or your claps. Five, six, ready, and nice. 
rehearse? Okay, y'all rehearse this before coming, huh? Okay. Okay, so now on this side, we're going to do the peanut butter, right? Okay, but you know, you have to be more like live than they were. <laughs> and they were pretty live. Peanut butter, peanut butter, hey, peanut butter, peanut butter, ha, peanut butter, peanut butter, uh huh, peanut butter, yes, uh huh, uh huh, yes. Ready? And? Nice. Okay, they were pretty live. Okay. So oftentimes in societies, we're in our own rhythms, and we don't hear each other. And we, then we compete with each other. And then we want to be one-upping each other. But this is an opportunity to groove with each other. And make rhythm with each other. I'm pretty sure peanut butter and bread go together. So let's try that. We're going to start with you, and then I'm going to bring you in. And then I'm going to have you go down, and then I'm going to end here, OK? So starting here. Close your eyes. My name is Uzamaka Nkemdelem Wampa. I am an Igbo woman. When I got the message that I was coming to this foreign land, the United States of America, the land of milk and honey, I wore my wig. I fixed my walk. I watched Come Into America again. My voice mastered a new identity. My name forgotten. Uzmaka Nwankpa. Uzi Nwankpa. Uzi. Uz. Uzo. Life actually turned out like the movie Coming to America. Although there is no such place like Zamunda. Nor am I a part of the top 1% of the rich in Africa. Akim's experience in America is quite similar to mine. Camouflaged in skin that no longer belonged to me. I had so many expectations given to me and dancing. Get your Western degree. Go to school. Be the best. Don't 
behave like those black Americans we see in the Or, don't marry a white man, no. Or, get your education, then marriage, then children. Or, your husband must be Christian, educated, of the Igbo tribe, and able to bring the moon to you. You see, I did everything I could to assimilate, to survive. My talk, my walk, my hair. Can we talk about my hair? My identity became chaotic. In America, I am black. In black America, I am African. Africa, I am a queer maiden, unmarried, without the fruit of the womb. We, blacks, African descendants, are constantly salvaging, scraping whatever is left of our identities, the hidden truths of our indigenous connections, who we truly are. I often ask myself, who am I? Is the African woman visible in this country? Am I not to exist? Am I to become black American? When immigration knocks on my door, my heart still jumps. This fear, this illusion is enough to drive me insane. I mean, I pray, I dance, I switch, I swivel, I glide, I mourn, I bleed, I fly, I swear. My generational traumas, they continue to haunt me. They haunt my mother. They haunt my child. You see, some of us do not survive in this here land of milk and honey. But I, I survive. People have a way of dealing with me, tearing apart what they cannot pronounce or conceive of. Hey you, why don't you jump around, you know, all jungle-like, do your little African dance. You, extorting the answers out of me. I asked you for some patience, but you, Pearly white, drumming gestures, aspiring to be the one that beats, rather than the one subject to the beating. Held up to signify how many years I should dance for you, like I am your slave. Yes, I learned kuku, sofa, yamama, kakilambe, jole, from a white girl from Michigan. Who changed her mask to match the one I left behind? You see, I felt ashamed. But I wanted to be informed, so I danced, and I danced it hard, despite the numerous cultures that exist in West Africa. In this land of milk and honey, they make it all sound like one sound. I am not afraid to be the never-ending bridge. I am not afraid to be the never-ending bridge. The year was 1997. It was hot. Summertime. I could feel the beads of sweat dripping down my awkward 15-year-old body when my father asked me to get into the car. I had no idea where we were going. I got into the back seat, attempted to put the seatbelt on, but it never really worked. I could see the red, mud-colored, ground where the hawkers with their sway and their hips and their multiple colored scarfs and lapas, 
carried their freshly fried bean cake breakfast for sale. I remember sitting in the back of my dad's car, and behind his head was a neatly packed afro that was tight. And his shirt was white and crisp. And I could smell his musk cologne. On the radio, the newscasters were talking about something that seemed really dangerous. We drove through the beautiful trees, deep, dark green, light green, lime green, to this awkward portion, and he parked on the side of a hill, and we got out of the car and he grabbed my hand. I had no idea where we were or where we were going. There was a strange man across the road, and my father grabbed my hand and walked. And as we walked towards each other, this strange man who had a white hat on, you know, the kind that the house of people wear, and a huge boo-boo, you know, that you had to kind of lift up from the ground so you don't step on it. Him and my father shook hands and had pleasantries. My father reached in his back pocket and handed him the keys to the car we drove in, a 1975 Mercedes-Benz that was white and rustic. And he handed my father a brown envelope that was thick. And my father put it in his breast pocket and grabbed my hand and walked over to the other side of the road where we waited for my uncle to pick us up. Moments later, we arrived with a huge sign that said, Travel Agency. He had me sit in the corner while he walked, all handsome, in his freshly ironed dress pants, tan, you know, with the crease in the middle, and his freshly polished brown leather shoes. And as he clicked right to the front of the counter, there was a woman who was voluptuous, with bright red lipstick, and dark like me. She was sweaty. It was hot. And she had a curly wig on and a huge smile. And my father reached into his breast pocket and grabbed that brown envelope that was thick and handed it to the woman across the counter. And she, in turn, gave him a packet of papers. And my father walked over to me and he got down to my level and said, here's a one-way ticket to America. You are not to tell anybody you're traveling. You leave first thing in the morning. America. America. The feeling inside, it was like my dreams had been answered. I prayed every night to go to the United States of America, the land of milk and honey, where I can wear my short skirts <laughs> and drink Coca-Cola. The bus ride was seven hours long. I got to Lagos, at the time the capital of Nigeria, from my hometown, Ingu. I stayed in my uncle's house. He put me up for the night. 
And the next day, he took me to the airport. I was to fly KLM Airlines from Lagos to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam to London, from London to Washington, D.C. My uncle handed me $300. It was the most amount of money I had ever seen in my life. $300 going to America. <laughs> productive organs, the land where I can peacefully protest without repercussion, the land where I can seek refuge without, I can seek refuge, I can seek refuge on this land without being locked up in cages. My aunt came, she picked me up from the airport. She had one of those big cars, you know, the kind that you could just kind of have to step on and, you know? 
so we called it back home, which literally translates to poor man greeting the rich man. She handed me an apple. I'd never had an apple before. It was crispy and juicy and sweet and green. I gobbled it all up and threw it outside the window. Kefineme, what are you doing? We don't litter here. I'll get fined. This is my beginning of the socialization in this land. I mean, streets were pretty clean. She took me to my sister's house. I had two sisters living here in the US. Ndidi and Neneka. They were both 20 and 21 years old. They took care of me like they were my parents. I love them so dearly. I remember the apartment. It was a one bedroom apartment in Hyattsville, Maryland. The couch was like brown and red with flowers all over it. it had some rips in the cushion. And the chair was like a red leather chair to the corner. Mixed match. The china were all different colors. And they told me that it was all donated by the local church. They enrolled me in high school. They gave me a huge white t-shirt that said, Mikey. And big, huge pants, jeans, and some white tennis shoes. And I remember showing up to school that day, and they asked me my name, and I told them. Huh? What'd you say? What's your name? Where you from? You wore that from Africa? Y'all got clothes in Africa? You swing from trees? Huh? 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 Say that again? You smell African. African booty scratcher. It was very uncomfortable being in school. As a teenager, I remember the school nurse telling me that girls my age, little black girls my age, are more likely to get pregnant at 15. So she sent me to the Planned Parenthood to get the depot shot. The depot shot is a birth control that you can get every three months to prevent pregnancy. I was not sexually active. She was white. I remember being asked for my immunization papers. And when I showed my immunization papers and I was up to date, I was told, that I had to get re-immunized all over again. Maybe because I was carrying some disease that I didn't know about. <sighs> America was, um, there was a, a bit of a juxtaposition for me. It was the American dream, but I was starting to notice the nightmare in that dream. You know, surviving America is something that I'm still living today. Attempting to understand what it takes to survive 
and thrive on this land. There are 4.2 million black immigrants on this land. 26% of them are college educated. And out of the 26%, 56% of them are Nigerian. A good percentage of us get deported on a daily basis, mostly Jamaica, Nigeria, Guinea, and Senegal, top countries. When we see the face of immigration, we tend to see many kinds of faces, but I hardly ever see the black face. In America, I learned about racism. I learned that it mattered the color of your skin. You see, I had to strip down everything that I came with in order to assimilate, in order to survive on this land, right? So I would start off with saying, water. I want some water. Huh? Water? Huh? Water, water, huh? Water, water, huh? Water, 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 <laughs> the fear of immigration knocking on my door is one that I cannot describe. Imagine having to fear being deported, whether or not you are documented on this land. The fear that you do not belong here. Just by me speaking, the words that I say is a dead giveaway. Some advice I was given is stay under the radar. Do not get pulled over by the police. The police is not your friend. I was quite lucky to be socialized by a few African-American folk on this land who taught me about the history of this land. You see, I, I, I didn't know, I had no idea. I had no idea that the color of my skin meant something, and it meant something different. When I came to this country, I got in because I used my British passport. And with a British passport, you could get in, no visa necessary. In fact, you get six months to play. My Auntie Rose just passed away last week. And her children were denied 15 times because they had Nigerian passports. I guess we were one of those shithole countries, huh? I love my blackness. I mean, can you tell? <laughs> I mean, can you tell? <laughs> I had to learn what it was like to appreciate my blackness. As an African woman, I could walk tall, my head up high, wrap my lapas around, sway my hips, just like my mamas and my grandmamas. And when I came here, I could no longer have these lapas. I could no longer wrap my head. I could no longer speak in my native tongue. All that got stripped away, like uprooting a plant and planting it in unfertile grounds. I also learned 
that not just my blackness determined my health. There were other conditions, such as my sexual orientation, my religion, how much money I make, my social class, whether or not I had a disability or a different ability, that all determined how much I got to experience health and wellness in my body. Turns out, your zip code determines more of your quality of life than your genetic code. So where I work, live, and play plays a huge part on my life expectancy. And then when you start to layer all these conditions and social determinants, we get to do the math. I remember being in bed one day with my love, and my mother called. And I had to shush her because my mother could not find out that I was with a woman living together for three years. See, it is illegal to be queer in Nigeria. Back to my blackness, this awesome blackness. I had to learn how to reclaim that. I had to learn that going from here to here took a lot. It took acknowledging my ancestry. It took acknowledging the toxic stress that gets released in my system because of the fear of immigration or the fear of my queerness or the fear of blackness. I got to experience what it was like to move from, hey Uzo, where are you from? And I would say, I have come from the land of the Iwolo people via Eziago, and I am the descendants of my parents and my grandparents, my great-grandparents. To Uzo, where are you from? Check the box, black slash African. Toxic stress is a real thing. Imagine every time you have to fight something you release these hormones, they charge your body up, and you're ready to go fight, or you're ready to run, flight. Now imagine if that happens every moment, every moment, every day, day after day, after day, after day, after day, after day. Toxic stress is real. I'll tell you what happens. We'll start with the brain. We've got parts of the brain, like the amygdala, or the prefrontal of prefrontal cortex. I'm scanning my brain right now because probably the toxic stress has helped me forget. <laughs> and that's what it does. It affects your memory. It affects your judgment. It affects your ability to make sound decisions. It affects your emotions, your limbic system. It affects your nervous system. You're not able to properly regulate. The over-release of these hormones inflame our system. Let's move over to our immune system. We're not able to fight infections as quickly as those who are not experiencing constant toxic stress. So then I get sick, and then I go to the hospital then I can't afford to pay for it. 
and then they send me home to the home where I live, which isn't quite safe because there's mold and I have asthma because there's a big thing that releases things out of the thing and there's, I can't breathe, but I can't afford to move, you see. Our social conditions affect our health much more than our genetic makeup. So I can move from that environment to a green space, which means there's more grass for the kids to play, and there are more trees, and I can breathe so I can live longer, right? So when we begin to intersect all these pieces, we start to understand why particular people are sicker than other people. Moving to our cardiovascular system, our heart, you know, that pumps and keeps us alive. When those vessels are clogged because they're so inflamed, I'm much more likely to get a stroke at an early age or a heart attack, high blood pressure. That's like when the pressure is going through the hose and if the hose is working really well, then that's great. But eventually that hose starts to wear out and there are holes in there and then they start to leak or things start to get in there and plaque prevents the flow of the blood to my heart and my brain. Is this making any sense? Our endocrine system, that's the system that helps regulate, regulate our temperature, regulate our hormones, our thyroid is so important. So now I start to gain weight and I start to get large. And they say, oh, so why don't you just go work out? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But nobody asked me how much toxic stress am I experiencing? Where do you live? Who's your social support network? Have you experienced trauma recently? What about the generational traumas that we are carrying for our ancestors? Trauma is a real thing, right? Trauma is a real thing. I mean, I've got my own share of trauma. I mean, I think uh, probably gonna need a chair for this. The first time I ever experienced trauma. I was 13 years old at the bus stop, waiting for the bus for two hours, and it hadn't come. And a red sports car came by, stopped, asked me where I was going. I told him. He said, get in, I'll take you. So he took me, but then he passed my location. And at that point, I got really scared. I thought he was going to kill me. He took me to an unknown building and behind closed doors, my spirit hovered over my body. I thought I was gonna die. And when he was finished with my body, he asked me if I was a virgin, and I said, yes. He said, keep it up. What's your favorite ice cream? I said, I didn't know. I'd never had ice cream before. And he said, meet me at the same bus stop tomorrow, and I'll bring you some ice cream. No. No, 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 I remember. I remember, I remember, I remember the first time I ever experienced trauma was coming home 30 minutes later than anticipated after I was just violated. And my mother asked me, where I was, and I couldn't tell her. I 
I couldn't tell her. And so she beat me. And she beat me harder than she had ever beat me before because I couldn't cry. I couldn't cry. How could I? I had just experienced the worst thing that could ever happen to a young girl. No, 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 no. I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. First time I ever experienced trauma. I was witnessing my uncle, who was 24 years old at the time, force himself onto my sister over and over and over again. She was only six. No, 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 no. I remember, I remember the first time I ever experienced trauma. I am the attempted abortion that failed. Eimba, eny, eimba, eny, eimba, eny, eimba, eny, eimba, eny, eimba, eny, eimba, eny. Echini no dini zumbo o jeloba. One echio dini zumbo o jeloba. Chega da moro na mora na taro. One moga na chimu na omo na ma. Onyira uomo Aye Ihede noba Aye Ihede noba Echi ni no di ni zumbo go jeloba Mwane cho di ni zumbo go jeloba Cheka da mbogo na mboga na taro Wanne moga na chimu Na pomo na ma Onyira ngomu Aye Hedinoba 
ancestral powers to deal with my traumas. I learned that it wasn't only up to me to deal with my trauma. I'm only one person. I need the collective. We need to cry together. We need to dance together. We need to make music and rhythm together. We need to make art together, tap into the spirit together, pray together, meditate together. There's a saying that when a woman went for some healing to a healer, but the, the healer asked the woman, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop telling the story? And when did you stop finding comfort in silence? That saying resonates with me. I have heard that many indigenous people ask the same question. What happens if we start asking those questions? You see, I had to find ways to counter my risk factors. I needed to use protective factors, like having a system. I needed protective factors like getting an education, and I mean a decolonized education. I knew that I needed to make a little bit more money, but my education led to that. When I got into the healthcare system, I realized that it was pretty messed up, and we were making ourselves sicker because it was all about the money. How sick can we get you so that we can help you if until you come back for the side effects and then we can help you if, right? So I needed to find ways. For me personally, I needed to find ways to shake off all that maybe even didn't even belong to me. The things that belonged to my mother and her mother and her mother, because technically I am my grandmother's egg. That's the next lecture, folks, epigenetics. We can begin to imagine what it would be like if we decolonize our way of thinking around about health, health and well-being. What would it look like if we actually value communal singing and 
dancing. What if your doctor prescribed that for your depression? Wouldn't that be cool? What if you got the prescribed to go see a play like this so that you could connect with others? Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be amazing? if we could tap into the indigenous people of this land and what actually worked for them on this land back in the day before we heard them as settler, as settler colonialists, colonists. I don't even know if that's a real word. <sighs> My brain. How can we begin to imagine our own recovery? from not only our individual traumas, but also our collective traumas. When you hurt, I hurt. When you heal, I heal. But even cooler, when we do it together, the power of collective healing. One of my teachers, mentors, mamas, Mama Sobonfu Some, she's the carrier of ancient West African women's wisdom. And this is one of her quotes. Dancing itself is to help crack open those places in our psyche and in the bones in our bodies where unhealthy information is stored, held, so that we may release them, right? so that we may release them, so that we may release them. The singing is to act as water, to wash, to cleanse, and to purify those areas in our lives, to cry, is to wash away the grief. Imagine a world where we can tap into our ancient indigenous ways of healing. First by starting to say I'm sorry to what we've done to the people of this land, to what we've done to vulnerable people across the world. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you.